All right, good afternoon and welcome to the sixth lecture of the circuit, circuits module of uh, EEC, EECS 16A. Okay, so uh, today we are going to talk about a new topic. The new topic is going to be capacitance. So, of course, our goal is still to build touch screens. And uh, as several of you pointed out, that uh, the touch screen in your, uh, in your smartphone or on your tablet is probably actually not resistive. It's probably not, uh, the, it doesn't work the same way as the touch screen that you're about to build or you're building in the lab. Uh, and uh, I guess there are probably all sorts of ergonomics reasons and so on why uh, people change from uh, resistive touchscreens to capacitive touchscreens. But anyways, uh, we, want to, we want to figure out how to build such a capacitive touchscreen. And uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what this is in the first place, capacitance. Anybody has an idea? Capacity, eh? sounds good, right? I mean, it ought to be something important. So uh, today we are actually not going to get to the touch screen. We are going to talk a little bit about the physics, get some intuition of what the capacitor is. We are going to develop models for uh, uh, equations, sort of Ohm's law, if you want, for capacitors. And of course, we are going to start looking at circuits. So uh, let's, let's do a conceptual experiment. Let's say we had a uh, uh, sort of a uh, brain experiment, sort of a, a, a virtual experiment. So uh, let's say we had a current source like this, some current source. And then we connect the wire to it. Now, normally we would, uh, of course, close the circuit here. But let's do something a little bit different. Let's put, let's put these wires at a distance. So there is some, you know, that the, the wire somehow terminate here. And this wire also terminates over here. So we get something like that. And there is a gap in between. And the gap is air or a vacuum or something like that. Anyway, it's not a conductor, OK? So what's going to happen here? Well, current charges, of course, are going to flow out of this current source. And they probably come from down here, right? And what's going to happen to these charges? Well, they eventually, they end up here. And what are they going to do there? Well, suppose this was a bridge or a, a, a highway, right? And these were cars. And the bridge, somehow, it's a drawbridge and it's open. What would happen to the cars? They what? They will fall down? Hopefully not. <laughs> what, probably, what more likely is going to happen? They will just pile up, right? There's going to be uh, a lot of cars, cars here. And there is a lack of cars there. Okay? So... With electronic charge, sort of the same thing happens. There is positive charge here, and there is negative charge here. Actually, the negative charge, anybody has an idea what that is, probably? Yeah. Okay, so, so I didn't understand the, quite, quite everything. The... the Okay, so it's kind of, uh, uh, if you have negative charges on one side, you need to have compensating positive charges or something uh, like that. Yeah, so, so, but let's stick with the, uh, that's correct, and uh, that's sort of a very insightful explanation, but let's stick with sort of simple stuff. The negative charges, what is it most likely, actually, certainly, yeah? What is it? What are the charges that make up our currents? What are these things called? They have a name for Christ. Yes. Electrons. Those are electrons. And uh, at the top, at the top do we get positrons? 
Not really, not quite like that. Uh, uh, we are not going to get into this, but it's an in interesting concept that absence of electrons, if let's say normally, normally in uh, whatever this our conductor is copper, so we have a certain amount of certain number of electrons per uh, uh, a thousand electrons in that region. Well, if a, f if a few leave and they end up ultimately on that bottom side, then the rem what they're sort of the lacking electrons, they are now no longer, uh, they are lo no longer compensated, their charge is no longer comp uh, compensated by a, uh, a, a proton, and so you end up with a positive charge, even though there is not really positive particles that go there. Anyway, so we don't need to go into do quite, of, quite those details, and y your colleague sort of uh, uh, said that absolutely correctly, what's going on, but in the end, if you somehow could measure charge, you would find that there is negative charge on one terminal, there is a compensating positive charge on the other terminal. Okay, so uh, the question now is, how much charge do we have there? Well, it turns out that, uh, not too surprisingly, it depends on the voltage. Let's say we call this voltage Vc. Then the amount of charge that we have is going to be proportional to this Vc. So the charge... The charge that is stored here, the, the, the positive and negative charge, uh, is going to be equal to Q, C. Uh, it's going to be proportional to Vc, and the proportionality constant is called capacitance. And now we've already sort of the, uh, have already derived, sort of if you want, intuitively, uh, the equation that describes a capacitor. So uh, the first term here, that's a charge. And what's the unit of charge? Coulomb, okay, Coulomb, C. And uh, voltage, I'm not going to ask you what the unit is. I suppose you know that. Capacitance, well, what's the unit of capacitance? Anybody knows? Fair. Okay, farad. Or simply F. Okay? So we have a new unit. Most of the time, these farads are actually relatively few, so uh, uh, one farad capacitor is a very big capacitor. But, uh, so, uh, so it turns out that uh, for some structures, and we will use that later, we can actually calculate what the capacitance is. Suppose we had a contraption like this. This was two parallel plates, like this, one like this, and then another one below it, like this. That's all. It's just below it, like this. So the, this has an area, A. And uh, there is a distance between these two plates. Both plates, they are conductors. They're, for example, copper or so. But there is a distance D between these two plates. And the distance uh, in, in between there is something that doesn't conduct. It could be air. It could be vacuum. It could be uh, any kind of an insulator, a plastic. It could be glass, silicon dioxide, or so lots of choices. Anyway, something that doesn't conduct current. Well, if you have a contraption like this, then we can calculate easily what the capacitance is. The capacitance of this thing is going to be equal. See? It's going to be equal. Well, not too surprisingly, if this were parking lots, then the bigger you make the parking lot, the more cars fit, right? And so the more charge fits, more charge fits if you make A, the area bigger. But uh, somehow uh, the charges don't like it too much. They not, not, we don't get not going to get as many anymore if the distance is going to be large. So, I our analogy, the bridge, or so I don't know exactly how to spin that. And there is a proportionality constant, epsilon. This is called the permittivity. Mm. 
Let me see that I do this right, 2T. Okay, so permittivity. Permittivity, this epsilon is actually two terms. It's going to be an epsilon zero, and that is sort of a universal constant, like the speed of light. Uh, and it, its value is 8.85 approximately times 10 to the minus 12 farad per meter. You can see that the farad per meter is sort of like resistivity, then it comes out, the units come out right. Okay? Uh, so we, oh, what did I do again? Oh, gee. Ah, okay. So ergonomically, I mean, this is not about ergonomics, but this is the stupidest place where to put this stupid panel here. Where this is where you put your hand. Oh. Anyways, these people, they design it. They never try to use it. It's like, like some word processors. Or so they're wonderful, except that if you try to use them. Uh, oh, okay, so, 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 so that's not the topic of this course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's this permittivity. Also, sometimes we simply write this as 8. 0.85 picofarad per meter because pico is the SI unit, uh, SI scalar for 10 to the minus 12. Okay? Very small. Okay? So we need to have a large A and a small D if we want to have a big capacitor. And, uh, and uh, there is another part to this, or, and that's a material constant. So depending on the material that is in between here, in between these plates, we get a different value for epsilon r. And uh, I'll just give you two examples. One, vacuum, or also air. If it's not too humid, then this epsilon r is equal to 1. Okay? And the other example is water. And then this epsilon r is approximately equal to 80, much larger. The reason I say this is that whenever we see something like that, as engineers we say, hmm, this is interesting. Perhaps in my successful career as an engineer, perhaps I will come across a problem where I could use this. And just to make sure that our, our brain is already trained to jump on that opportunity to, you know, make our startup or whatever it is successful, uh, we think a little bit, what could that be? Anybody has an idea what something we could do with this fact that uh, if we have water, then suddenly the capacitance gets much larger? Yes. That's a good idea. People? Yeah, your, your colleague is absolutely right. You know, we are really big bags full of water. There is a few structures and so on, a few impurities in the water, and granted, they make quite a bit of a difference. I wouldn't want to miss mine, okay? But... But if you just looked at counted all the molecules, water would win by a long shot. Okay, so that's that's the thing, and maybe we can use this somehow. Uh, this fact maybe to make certain detectors, like even uh, uh, touch touch sensors or so. In some case, some touch sensors they exploit this fact. Any other ideas what we could do with it? What about uh, uh, the gauge in uh, a tank gauge, fluid gauge? Well, we could have some kind of a capacity. We, have, we could have plates on either side of a tank, and as the fluid in the tank, water or, uh, fills up, then the capacity is going to increase. And as it gets empty, the capacity gets smaller. If we have a way, if we can figure out a way to measure what this capacity is, well, then we can know how much fluid is in the tank. Oh, sounds neat. Well, we'll do it on the homework. <laughs> so, okay, so what else do I want to? 
Okay, so so now, uh, so far, whenever we talked about the new circuit element, the voltage source, the resistor, so then we talked about IV characteristics. So let's talk about the IV characteristics of capacitors. And I put a question mark here. And you will see in just a second why there is a question mark. Well, we'll start with this. We'll start what we already know about capacitors. And that is this equation here. We know that the charge on a capacitor, I'll, I'll write it without the C because we know that we talk about, about capacitors, is equal to C times V. Well, this kind of nasty, I mean, we would like I mean, if you want to have an IV characteristic, the voltage is good, but we also would like to have what else? Yes. It's a difference in charge between the two. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, either is correct. It's, it's. Yeah, you could just look at all the positive charge on the negative one. Okay, so uh, so all oh, oh, right. So this equation has a little bit of a of a flaw. If we want to draw an IV characteristic, uh, the voltage is well present. That's nice, but there is no current. Anybody has an idea of how we can get current into the picture? Well, any yes. Ah, okay. So change over time, well, what is change over time? That is sort of sounds like dt. Huh? So what we do is we do the derivative with respect to time dt. So let's assume that the capacitor does not change as a function of time to make our e equation simple, okay? So then this must be equal to c times dv dt. And then... As your colleague correctly pointed out, what is dQ dt? That is current. So now we sort of have our wish. We now have an equation that includes current and voltage, so we ought to be able to draw an IV characteristic. Can we do that? Why not? Well, because the voltage now is in this differential. So uh, it's a little bit special, the uh, characteristic of, of a capacitor. It depends on time. It suddenly depends on time. And I explicitly sort of said I of t because... Uh, uh, I, of course, could depend on T, or V of T, the voltage could depend on time. So, but if the voltage was constant, what would happen? Well, dV of T would be what? Zero, and then the current is zero. What do we call this thing? Where the current is always zero? An open circuit. So, so this doesn't see this doesn't look very useful. I mean, we just came up with a new element, and the new element is not too surprisingly. I mean, if I cut the wire, I get an open circuit. So what's the rub? Why do we still talk about capacitors if they're just open circuits? Well, if the voltage changes, then we suddenly have current flowing. So capacitors are unique in the sense, compared to all the elements that we talked about, that time matters. Resistors or so, they don't care about time. They simply care about what voltage you put across, what is the resistance value, and then they tell you what, how, mu how much ever current they're going to run. They couldn't care less of whether it's day or night or to day, today or tomorrow. But uh, capacitors apparently do, and we will see just in a moment that this will give us a lot of opportunities. Time is sort of a useful thing. So uh, let's look at a simple example. 
let's say we had a voltage source Vs. So this is an example. We had a voltage source Vs, and then we put a capacitor C across this voltage source. We would like to know what is the voltage across the capacitor. And of course, also we would like to know what is the current that is flowing I C. Okay? Well, we can use, of course, like always, we can use uh, uh, KVL. And from KVL, we find that uh, if we do this, sort of go around the loop, uh, minus Vs plus Vc is equal to zero. Vc is equal to Vs is equal to constant. And now we have Ic is equal to d Vc dt times the value of the capacitance. And unless that's infinite, this guy is zero, and then the whole thing is also zero. Okay? So, uh, behaves as an open circuit, this capacitor. So, by the way, this situation where, where voltage is constant, where everything is constant, nothing changes with time, is very important, so it has a name, it's called steady state. So that basically means that d, v, or any v, or d, 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 i, d, t, nothing changes. That's called steady state. Okay. So steady state here. Let's look at an other example. Okay, this time we're going to do almost the same thing, but we're going to use a current source, Is. And we put this current source across a capacitor C. And again, we would like to know what is the voltage Vc. And of course, we know already what the current is here. Ic and Is are equal because of KCL, I'm not going to write this down again. Okay? So, how are we going to so we have IC is equal to IS is equal to C times D, V, C, D, T. Hmm? So we can solve for D, V, C, D, T is equal to I, C over C. Huh? So apparently the voltage is now changing, so I well can indicate that with V of T, and here the voltage is changing. How could we calculate what the voltage is? What is it? Is it zero? Is it a volt? Is it 10 volts? Who is for 10 volts? <laughs> so what opinion do you have? What is the voltage? How would you calculate this? It's an integral, right? So, so uh, we, how do we solve an equation like this? Well, we, we put the dt on the other side, so we multiply with dt, so we have dvc of t is equal to ic over c times dt. Okay? And then we are going to do an integral on both sides from zero to some interesting time t. And then what's the left side here? Well, the left side, 
is simply going to be equal to v c, and again that's a function of t. Going to change. And what's the right side? Well, let's assume that the current is constant and the value of the capacitance is also constant. So we can pull those out of the integral. So it's going to be IC over C times the integral from 0 to T dt. So that's IC over C times T. Plus there is something that we have to add here. What do we have to add here? You have to add the voltage on the capacitor that time t equals zero. Okay? So we have to add the initial condition. So this is how we solve this. Uh, happens to be a differential equation, but one of the simple ones, fortunately. So, and and uh, turns out that sort of that's kind of what we are going to do at at this in in, in 16a. We are going to so sort of run a constant current into a capacitor, and then we are going to figure out what happens, and we've calculated this now just. So uh, we, we won't have to uh, solve many of these differential equations, fortunately. Uh, in, in, in 16b, then, goes a little bit further. Okay, so uh, let me, before I forget, let's 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 think about uh, let, let's think about a little experiment we could do. So let's say we we uh, we uh, run this current source into the capacitor, the current into the capacitor for some time, and let's say the voltage now on the capacitor is just passes five volts, and then we immediately remove the current source, we rip away the wire. Okay, what's going to happen? What is uh, what is going to be what's going to happen to the voltage we see? Well, uh, what happened, right? Initially, maybe VC was zero. The current source started pushing something into that capacitor. What did it push into the capacitor? Charges, right? Charges. It puts charges into the capacitor. And then we remove the current source. Well, it cannot put more charges into the capacitor, right? But it has put already a billion charges there, and maybe that that makes it that we have uh, five volts. Now, what is going to happen to these charges? There's no more wire. Where do they go? Well, if 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 they uh, just ended up in Treasure Island, and then you remove the bridges, both the one to Oakland and the one to uh, San Francisco, where are they going to be? They're going to be stuck on Treasure Island, right? Well, here the same thing. These charges, they, were, they are now on the capacity. They remove the wires. The bridges are gone. The charges cannot go anywhere, so they're going to stay put. Okay, if the charge apparently then doesn't change anymore. Well, if the voltage just before we moved the wire was 5 volts, what is going to be, what is the voltage going to be when we, after, just after we remove the wire? 5 volts, right? Because the same amount of charge is still present. Well, that's kind of interesting, you know. It's kind of interesting. Amazing, huh? It just stay, stick, stays around there. Any idea? Is there something we could do with this? is useful? Do, do you maybe, yeah? That's a, that's a good idea. Maybe we could use these charges now that we have them there. They are stored. We could use them to go and uh, go uh, charge, yeah, charge something else. Maybe even uh, charge, uh, maybe even uh, run, run a motor with it or run the lights or something. In fact, uh, who has a bicycle when you turn off the generator and the light stays on, something like that? No? My tricycle does that. <laughs> if, if it has a generator, so I generate, uh, when, I'm, when I ride it, I generate uh, the power to power the light, uh, but when I then stop at a stop sign, the light keeps running. And how does it do that? Well, it has a capacitor. It just stores some extra charge. I worked hard, right? Uh, it stores some charge on the capacitor. That capacitor then runs 
runs the, uh, uh, the, the brake line, and so people still can see me. So that's why I'm still alive. Good thing. Uh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a nice idea. Uh, any other ideas? Something we could do with it? You know, memory, memory isn't that kind of a useful thing. Do you, do you own things that, that sometimes are called memories? No, mm -mm, not at all. You have your brain, of course, but there are probably no capacitors inside. So sure, but. You, you, have, a, uh, you have a computer? Anybody has a computer? Yeah, really? Are you sure? And, and, but it's got no memory, right? Your computer has no memory. You need to tell it. If you need to add two numbers, you have to tell it what numbers to add, and afterwards it immediately forgets the result, right? No, we could make memory out of this. How could we make memory out of this? So, what we, how we could make memory out of this is we have this capacitor C, and let's say we put a switch here, and we want to store, we want to store a yes, Let's say connect the switch to 5 volts, okay? And uh, if at some later point we want to store a no, then we connect the switch to 0 volts, uh, we co connect the capacitor to 0 volts. So what we do is whenever we want to store something, we decide do we want to store a 1, then we close this switch briefly, then we open it again. What is going to be the voltage on the capacitor? 5 volts. And then we say, no, now we want to store something else. I have a memory where you cannot change the content isn't that terribly useful. Well, uh, unless it's programmed to just write code, like the result of the, of the exam. But uh, and we want to change it. Well, then we connect the capacitor to zero volts, re remove the connection again, and now uh, the voltage across the capacitor is going to be zero volts. If you have some way to go and measure that voltage, let's say you're a voltmeter or so, then we could figure out what we've stored on the capacitor. Okay? Well, this is how DRAM works. Anybody owns DRAM? No? Yes, at least one or two. Uh, uh, you have a question? Zero ground, yes. Okay? Yes, yeah, so, so DRAM. You all own DRAM. Gobs of it, right? Gobs of it. Uh, there is this, right, the, the new phone has two gigabytes or gigabits or I don't know what of DRAM or your laptop. You got the new model that has eight gigabytes of memory or so. What it really has is eight, eight times eight billion of these. Okay? That's useful. It's pretty useful. Hey, I mean, uh, you couldn't play with your uh, with your smartphone there back there uh, if you didn't have DRAM. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so uh, so yes, yeah, so so actually, actually this this thing here, uh, uh, I forgot to show that we could of course now plot. We could plot as a function of time the voltage across the capacitor Vc of T, and it would look like this. It would start at Vc, here's time zero, Vc of time equals zero, and then it would ramp at a slope that is equal to Ic over C. So we finally also uh, drew some kind of a plot, but it's not an IV plot, it's a, it's a Vt plot, if you want, okay? So, uh, okay, next topic. Let's talk about equivalent capacitance. Okay, equivalent capacitance. Well, what do we mean? Well, we've seen that uh, we have a whole pile of resistors and they're somehow connected, parallel series and whatever. 
then we can, if, we all, if all we have is resistors, we can replace all these resistors between any two points. We can figure out an equivalent resistance, and the thing behaves just exactly the same as the maze of the resistors that we're replacing it or modeling. Okay, so uh, so uh, this capacitor works exactly the same way. We have a, we have some kind of a box inside that box, or lots of capacitors connected in all sorts of weird ways, whatever whatever it may be. And then there are two terminals that are somehow connected somewhere on the outside of the box, and. Uh, we want to know, we want to know what is the equivalent capacitance. Well, what it really means is that uh, we could have another box, and inside that box we have something that we call CEQ, and it has again same connections. And if we add these two boxes, even though one of them has many more capacitors than the other one they would behave exactly the same. If you cannot open the box and see what's inside, they behave exactly the same, okay? So if we apply voltages and currents and so on, exactly the same thing happens for the box on the left and the box on the right. So uh, so uh, now, uh, how are we going to figure out if we have, if we had a circuit like this one, like this one, how are we going to figure out uh, how, what capacitance, what the equivalent capacitance is of that thing? Well, let's let's suppose that we, we do this in the in the lab. Uh, could we put just a constant, like like we've done this, we've done this with resistor? Could we simply apply a constant test voltage source between these two terminals? Could we do that? Would that help us? Yes. Okay. So okay. So the suggestion is, uh, well, uh, instead of uh, 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 applying a, a voltage, maybe we should apply a current. That's a really good idea. Uh, we'll we'll try this. So, but let's let's say. Let's figure out first why connecting a voltage there wouldn't do us any good. Well, unless the voltage is changing, then d test dt is going to be equal to zero. That means the current is going to be equal to zero, and we cannot learn anything whatsoever from our, from our experiment. What we would have to either do is make it that dv, d, dv test dt is not zero, or... As your colleague suggests, uh, more simply, we just could apply a test source, I test. Okay, and then, uh, and then we could measure, then we could measure the change of voltage. Uh, likewise, of course, we could also apply uh, a V-test a v that changes, and then we could measure the current again. That, that, that would work too, right? Okay, so let's actually try that. So, uh, let's, uh, let's try this. Let's make it not too complicated. Okay, let's just have uh, two capacitors, C1 and C2, and they are connected in parallel, and we are applying a test, dv test dt here, and then we are figuring out what is the current that is flowing, okay? So, uh, well, if we have dv dv test dt there, then we have here also dvc dt and dvc d1, dvc2 dt, okay? We have a cross here. Sort of a, a special voltage, a voltage that's changing. So, so uh, how could we figure out? Well, ic1 then is equal to C1 times dv C2 dt, 
Well, that is equal to C1 times, well, Vc2 is equal to V test, right? Vt. You agree? Yeah. Oh, because my memory wasn't working right. See, memory is important. Okay. Any other questions? Ah, look at this. I, I, at least I'm consistently wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is equal to dvt dt. So vt is what we test. I just somebody correctly pointed out on Piazza that maybe I should try to write legibly. Point taken. I'll try to do that, but then I write less. Okay, so then there is less gibberish. Uh, I see two is equal. To C2 times dVt dt. So that's IC2. And then IC1 plus IC2 is equal. Well, let's factor out the dVdt. So then that is equal to C1 plus C2 times dVt dt. And C EQ is equal to the uh, total current so this is really I total I, I test if you want this is really I test huh? divided by D V T D T okay so uh, wait, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. So now if we, if we do this, if we, the equation that we have up here, we do that, what we get C equal equals C1 plus C2. Okay? This is kind of useful. So basically what it says is if, if you have two capacitors, C1 and C2, like this, then this is equivalent as like ha having just one capacitor like this and the capacitance is what do you think about this? yes ok so the question is how do we know that uh, the voltage across the capacitor let's say for example here we see C2, uh, Vc2, to the right for, for a change, is equal to Vt. Okay? That's the question? Correct. Okay. So uh, the, the way we figure that out is we do a, a, a KVL. So we make a loop, a full loop. Okay? And then uh, we, we move along here. Oops! We, we encounter V1 and v, v, Vc2. And we enter at the minus sign, so we have minus Vc2. And then we move on. Oh, we are, we are encountering another voltage that we have to jump over. This one we enter at the plus, si plus sign, so we, we put it into our equation with the plus, is equal to zero. And now we have uh, Vc2 is equal to Vt. Answer your question? Okay, and you can do the same thing, of course, also for VC1, you make a slightly l l larger loop. You can make any kind of loops. So, so the, the the secret sauce here is KVL, okay? And uh, Yeah. Yeah, you could also uh, solve this with node voltage analysis, by the way, uh, if you just add it. Uh, it would be a little bit pathological here, but uh, uh, it would work. So uh, what you would have here is you would have a source, Vt, and you would have some elements like this, and you would, uh, would assign a, uh, some, well, there would be actually two, like this, 
one and C2, you would, uh, what is the first step? Yeah, well, we would assign a uh, ground node. What's the second step? Node voltage analysis. What's the second step? Any, any node voltage that is known, we label it. Okay? We know, is there any node voltage that is known? Yeah, two of them. This one here, zero volts. Actually, this one I usually don't label, but if you want to be totally follow the rules, then you label that too. And any other one? Well, this one here, that's VT here. Right? And then you know that all of this is a node. This is a node. Okay. And the voltage everywhere on the node is the same. So if we, let's say, call this one, this voltage Vc1, well, because on the other side it's zero, then that means that the, the node voltage here is Vc1. And, uh, well, the node voltage here is Vc1, but this is also called Vt. So Vc1 must be equal to Vt. So now we've solved this node voltage analysis. We didn't actually have to write down any, any uh, KCL, KCL equations in this case because there was only one node here present, aside from the common node, and that was one where we knew it already because there was a voltage that was pinning that, that voltage. So, well, I don't know. I, I'll keep this. I'll keep this in the notes for those who watch the tapes. Where was I? Okay, so uh, so getting back to this thing here. Two capacitors in parallel, they just add up. The equivalence is, you, if you want a bigger capacitor, just take two and put them in parallel. What about resistors? If you have two resistors and put them in parallel? Yeah? Yeah, then you get this, this other, this parallel equation. They actually, the resistance gets smaller, right? So be very, very careful. Uh, capacitors and resistors, these equations, they're almost the same, except that they're just opposite of each other. And in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, converse, you can also derive this one here, C1, C2, and this also the equivalent capacitance C, it's going to be equal, CEQ is going to be equal to C1 times C2 over C1 plus C2. Just like we would have for two resistors in parallel. So it's just the opposite. And, and just, so this is CEQ. And uh, just I warn you, it's very common to write it like this. Okay? It's very common to write this thing. And that, that may be a little bit sort of raise a flag because we use sort of the parallel symbol here, which makes perfect sense if you look at the expression, right? This parallel symbol, if we treat this as an operator, then this parallel symbol really means that you know, we just need to multiply the two and divide by the sum. Okay? So that's parallel as an operator. But of course, C1 and C2, they're not at all parallel. They are actually in series. Okay? So just beware of that. Engineers sometimes are a bit funny. We use this. Even though the resistors are in series, we use the parallel symbol simply because it's easier to, to write. It's, it's simpler to write this than to write this here, okay? So, just, I warned you, simple convention. Okay. Okay, let's do an example. Let's, example eight. Yeah, if I write example, it, you can't read it anyway, so I just write EX. So, uh, uh, let's say this is our example. There's a C1 
and there is a and so these are terminals A and B the C2 C3 and we want to represent we want to figure out what would be the equivalent capacitance that we have the same characteristics so B or A where we could replace this thing with so how would you do this Actually, you know, I let you do this. You figure it out. Again, you talk to your neighbors. Use your notes. Okay, anybody has already made a little bit of progress? How would you approach this? If it was a, yes. I think that's right. So we get right away the, the expression. Everybody understands that? We're done. I can go to the next problem. Who wants that we go through this? One, just one person. Okay, so I mean, I also will do that. I'm sure there are actually more. Okay, so how do we solve a problem like this? Well, we first look at the simplest configuration. These two, they are in parallel. So uh, C2 plus C3, that's the equivalent capacitance of these two. Let's call this C23. And now we have a new circuit that is a bit simpler than before, C1, C2, 3. And we know the value of that. And so that's again B, and here is A. And now we get uh, C, the, the equivalent of this CEQ is equal to C1 in parallel with C2 plus C3. Well, it's in series, but it's a parallel operator, right? It, it's again this thing. C1 times C2 plus C3 over C1 plus C2 plus C3. Do you get the same? Okay, good. So, solve this. Okay, and so you can make any orbit. Uh, I think on the homework or so we have some other examples. Okay, let's look at the new, a new thing that we could try to do with capacitors. Let's say we have two capacitors here, C1 and C2, and we charge them to some voltage. Is there a, you have a question? No? Okay. Uh, okay, so we have two capacitors. We charge them to two, volt, two, two voltages, VC1 and VC2. Uh, how do we do that? How do we charge a capacitor to a voltage? What does it mean? Yes. We could do that. We absolutely could do that. And then when it's the right voltage, we can remove the current. Because if we keep the current source connected, then, of course, the voltage will continuously change. It will ramp, right? An even simpler thing would be, let's say you have a 5-volt battery, or, or whatever, right? and you wanted to charge your capacitor to 5 volts. What would you do? You just connect the capacitor to the battery. Uh, the capacitor will charge, it will consume a little bit of energy from the charge, from the battery, and then it will be charged to 5 volts. You can remove the battery, disconnect the wires, and the capacitor is now charged to 5 volts. The voltage on that capacitor is going to be 5 volts. So that's how you do it, okay? So we can simply uh, uh, charge these to uh, 
do whatever voltage we want, then we have capacitors here and there charged to a voltage VC1, this one, and the other one to a voltage VC2. And we could use it as a memory or, or a energy storage or whatnot, okay? So now let's actually, sort of for, for simplicity, connect both of these to ground. In, incidentally, meaning, I, 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 I'm not sure whether I've ever said that, meaning that if, if, I, if I put two ground symbols in different places of a circuit, what I mean is that, what it means is that they are connected. So it just makes a circuit diagram simpler. But now also what I'm going to do is going to, I'm going to connect these two together. Okay? I'm going to connect both capacitors together. So now uh, uh, VC1 and VC2, are they still going to be different? No, they're now going to be the same, but they're going to be the same values they were before. Probably not. They have to be something new, okay? So, uh, so how would you figure out the voltage, the new voltage, let's call this uh, V nu. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, so this would be kind of, if, if we were to wanted to write this correctly, this would be at time k, k, and this would be also at time k, and V nu would be at time k plus 1. I'm using the same nomenclature as we've, as we've used in module 1, right, where time changes, and then we just indicate that with k being different, okay? You remember that, okay? So, uh, so that's how we sort of make it clear that these are not voltages that should all be the same. They're not really the same. Uh, okay, so uh, how would you figure that out? Well, what, what, wh why does uh, was capacity before I made this connection here? Why does capacity? Why is the voltage on capacitor C one uh, VC one? Why is that the voltage there? Why do we have that voltage there? Well, of course, because we programmed it to that voltage. We connected the battery, right? We sort of programmed it, if you want. But what, what's really happened? What is really the sort of physical cause that makes it the voltage is now 5 volts? Yes. Exactly. We put charge on this capacitor. So when I suddenly make this connection here, what happens to that charge? The charge now has new opportunities. The charge that was on capacitor C, C1 now can either stay on the capacitor C1 or it can go to the capacitor C2 or it can somehow spread between the two in any arbitrary fashion, right? And likewise, the charge from capacitor 2 can now distribute over both capacitors 1 and capacitors 2, okay? Uh, but it's uh, it's still going to be there. there. It has no other place to go. The charge, the charges from capacitor one and capacitor two, they're still there. There just maybe so, maybe some of it left capacitor C one and went to capacitor C two instead. Okay, but the total charge is still the same. So let's figure out what the charge is before I close that switch. So the charge Q one at time k is equal to C1 times the voltage on, on, the, on the capacitor C1 also at time K, right? That's before I make this connection. I guess I could have indicated a switch that I close at time K plus, right? or K, K plus 1. And then what is the charge on capacitor uh, C2? Just before I open the switch, well, it's also going to be equal to C2 times VC2 of time K. What's the charge on both capacitors Q total of time K plus 1? Why time K plus 1? Because now I've closed the switch, okay? Well, that charge is going to be equal to Q1 of K plus Q2 of K. Eh? So that's going to be equal to C1 times VC1 of K plus 1 
plus C2 times Vc2 of K. Okay? And that is also going to be equal to the voltage Vn of K plus 1, which is also equal to the new Vc1 of K plus 1 is, e so, yeah, so this times the capacitance at that node. What is the capacitance there? Well, the total capacitance now, they're both in, well, it's going to be uh, equal to C1 plus C2. Okay? And so this is also equal to Vc1 of K plus 1, and this is equal to Vc2 of K plus 1, and that's not equal to Vc1 of K except in some pathological cases. Okay, so uh, now what do we want to know? Well, we can solve this for Vn of k plus 1, and that is equal to uh, C1 times Vc1 of k, what we programmed the capacitor 1 to C2 times Vc2 of k, over C1 plus C2. Okay. So this somehow, uh, if, if this was, uh, if both capacitors were equal, this circuit would just compute the mean of Vc1 and Vc2. Right? It's kind of neat. A very simple circuit that can calculate the average of two numbers. In fact, if we wanted to calculate the average of more than two numbers, could we do it also? Any idea? How could you do that? Well, we just use three capacitors, four capacitors, and so on. We all program them to whatever voltage we want, and then we all connect them together, and we get the average. Okay? If all the capacitors are equal, and then we get the average. If they're not equal, well, then we will get a weighted average. A weighted average, what is that? Well, it's kind of like a, a dot product, right? So one big application is of do these dot products is machine learning. In machine learning, we'll see you look in, in 16b, you will see you use lots of dot products. You could use a circuit like this to compute them very efficiently with little power dissipation. Okay. Uh, well, there, there turns out that the, uh, the f because uh, because of this charge conservation, we can we can do lots of different uh, really neat things. So uh, let me just get the so let's let's uh, yeah may maybe I just have enough time roughly. To, uh, to do one more example. Let's say we have a source Vs plus minus and uh, let's connect this to uh, switch S1 and uh, also switch S2. And then we have a capacitor C1 here. And uh, then we connect to a switch, S, another switch S2, and another switch S1 here. And we put yet another capacitor here, okay, C2. So why do I call these switches? Uh, S1 and S2, well, because uh, they're operated in a, in a very special fashion. So as time goes on, S1, all switches S1, they are going to be closed, and then afterwards they're going to be open. And uh, switches that are labeled S2, they're going to be open, and then afterwards, when we, when we open the switches S1, then they're going to be closed. Okay? And so we can repeat this. Okay? 
So this is a circuit where sort of we use these switches to do one thing, and then, in a way, you can think of it that we have two, two different circuits in the same circuit diagram, depending on if are we in time, in time one, or are we in time two, then we just use switches to reconfigure the circuit. In fact, let's look at that. What is the circuit during, this is actually called phase. Oh. Phase one. I see my writing doesn't get better. Uh, So uh, let's say during phase one, what is the circuit that we have? Well, we have our voltage source here. And then what about switch S1? Is it open? Is it closed? Okay, switch S1, is it open, is it closed? Switch S1 is closed, yes, that's this one. This one is closed. Okay, so what's a closed switch? What's the simplest sort of equivalent of a closed switch? It's a wire, it's a short circuit. Okay, so this short circuit. Then here we get to capacitor C1. And uh, we have another switch S1. Oh, I guess I need, I need one more switch here. Okay. Another switch S1. C2. Okay. And then, so, uh, oh, and there is another, uh, another ground node here. So basically, what, what do I have? Well, I have apparently two capacitors. Are, are they in parallel or in series? They're in series. And I charge both of these to Vs. No, no, well, not both of them. I charge the combination equivalent capacitance. I charge to, charge to Vs. And from that, I can figure out what charge I have. Okay, then I, I go and switch this into phase two. So I again, during phase two, I still have my source. And uh, there is now, S1 is going to be closed, uh, is going to be open, so this doesn't do anything, but the switch S2 there. Can be. So we have uh, C1, and then... We have C2. And let's say we want to figure out what is the voltage here. Okay. These look very similar, these two circuits, except for one thing. Look at this. Uh, it's not exactly the same. Here, let, uh, let me label this. This is the voltage VC1. Huh? And here, we have, we have... I connect, I connect on the other side of it. Right? I connect on the other side. So, uh, let's say if uh, before... Let's, let's call this voltage uh, v, Vc. If that was the voltage across my two capacitors. Well, that voltage now is going to appear where? That voltage is going to be... It's kind of on... This is, I haven't... I haven't <laughs> 
not sure whether I did this right. Well, let me let me think about this later. Uh, I do this. Uh, you know, let's scrap this. Let's scrap this. I, I, I must have done something wrong. So let's just forget these. Uh, I cannot think so. So, uh, but let, let's, let's do something else. Let's do, do something else. Let's, let's suppose that we have a, a voltage source that was uh, equal to equal to, uh, let's say, 5 volts, okay? And we actually needed minus 5 volts. How would it generate that? Well, we could use a capacitor. We charge this capacitor to 5 volts, right? And we connect it here to ground. Okay? We, we charge this capacitor to 5 volts. Now we want to create minus 5 volts. So uh, what we could do is we could take this capacitor and we connect instead, instead we connect the positive terminal, we connect that one to ground, and then the voltage across this VC is going to be equal how much? 5 volts, we programmed it to 5 volts, right? So we're going to get here minus 5 volts because the voltage here is 5 volts. Okay, so now all we need to do is, of course, I mean, rewiring our circuit every time isn't that much fun. So uh, what we want to do is we want to now use switches so that we can go from from this configuration, let's call this phase one, to this configuration, let's call it phase two. Okay? So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to have We have two switches, and we connect to ground and to the voltage source, Vs, or capacitor, okay, C. And then we are going to open these switches, and now we want to get to the configuration of phase two. So we're going to put, we need to put now this, this terminal, the upper terminal of the capacitor, we need to connect that one to ground. So we're going to put the ground here, S2, and the other voltage, that's, that's our output. That's our output. The out, that's where we take our, our output voltage. This is, this is me out. Okay, so, so apparently what we can do with uh, capacitors, we can not only, like with voltage divider, we sort of can make voltages smaller. With capacitors, we can take a positive voltage, 5 volts, we can make it minus 5 volts. And uh, could we also uh, use capacitors that, let's say we have 5 volts, a 5 volt supply, but for some reason we needed 10 volts, could we do that also? Do you have an idea on how to do that? How would you do that? Any ideas? How many cap? Uh, you, know, you could use two capacitors. Actually, maybe you could even work with one. So how would you do this? Well, doubler. How would you do this? We, would have a, we have a voltage source, 5 volts, right? And we want to generate 10 volts. Well, we take a capacitor. See? This one now is charged to 10 volts. And that's phase one. Huh? Now we want to have 10 volts. Well, we go to phase two. 
In phase two, the circuit that we want is we have still our five volt source, so that's quite useful. But what's the voltage on our capacitor? Well, that's five volts. So we just put our capacitor on top here. What's the voltage here? Well, it's going to be 5 volts from the capacitor and 5 volts from the source. So it's going to be 10 volts. Figure that out from KVL. So now in practice, this circuit is very useful, except that, uh, of course, you don't, want to, you don't want to reconfigure your circuit every time you want to double the voltage. You're going to use switches. So just like we've done before, you figure out where you need switches so that you can go from this configuration to this configuration here. You can make also, try to make a tripler, voltage tripler. You can do that too. Okay, so uh, these are some things we can do with capacitors. Next time, we are going to build a touch sensor out of capacitors. Okay. Thank you.